morning everyone welcome to our first guest lecture initiated under under vastra 24 i am sejal yadav your host for today's event and it brings me a great joy to extend a, a heartfelt welcome to this gathering today as we stand in the halls of vjti a college with a rich legacy dating back to its establishment in 1887 i cannot believe but feels immense pride in being a part of a esteemed textile department which was the first department a first branch initiated here the department continues to shine as one of the finest branches of vjti throughout our journey since 1887 we have consistently excelled not only in academics but also in extracurricular activities be in sports quizzes competitions making our students stand tall on the global stage many many legends like dr apj abdul kalam mr ratan tata sir have visited our institute and we are very proud of it a recent highlight was the visit of our union textile minister shri piyush goel sir and maharashtra education minister shri chandrakant patil ji to our textile department underscoring our crucial role in the national textile technical textile mission of textile ministry government of india who has provided a great support of rupees 9.5 crore from upgradation of laboratories now i would like to call our faculty coordinator dr arvind bhungade sir for giving you all a brief intro about vastra speaker for today's program professor thomas gris from germany caller from the germany over here to talk with the students uh, respected head of the department textile engineering department our beloved uh, alumni rsg dear faculty dear students basically uh, this program is the beginning of the vastra vastra is basically a national level uh, technical paper presentation that event happens on a particular day but is a series of event that happens uh, under that vastra umbrella it's so basically the umbrella which runs under the department it was began long back uh, with keeping in mind to interact with the student to interchange the or exchange the idea of the uh, innovations amongst the textile uh, students across india uh, due to the pandemic situation uh, last four years we could not uh, have this vastra but since we are normalized this year uh, we have given a thought to let us have our uh, awaited uh, event that is vastra so this is the first program under the vastra that today we have the guest lecture uh, that is uh, mr thomas chris is over here to guide us how uh, the uh, apart from our regular academics uh, what are the roles of the how the industry is going ahead at the very global level uh, talking about the conventional uh, textiles or you can say the overall uh, global uh, scenario in uh, the developing countries we have just started talking about the developments we are still in the process of the industry 3.0 where this, uh, we know that the industry 3.0 started with the digitalization and uh, global is now working on to the in hand with the automations we are still eagerly waiting the people or the investor to come forward and talk about the automation into the industry is not limited to the textile industry it is across all the industries in the developing countries so uh, how these uh, particularly uh, i think this is the second time uh, professor thomas is there on campus last year last time also we had some discussion with the uh, then director uh, 
uh, how our student, particularly at least the textile domain student, can uh, participate to understand the concept of the AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, computing, uh, cloud computing, or you can say the artificial intelligence, uh, IoT. So how these topics can be get incorporated and how the students can be trained in this particular area so that we will not be lagged behind and still struggling to work into the industry 3.0 that is uh, digitalization. Unless and until we uh, cope up with the global level um, demand, it is very going to be very difficult for the student and the uh, industry and the overall uh, academic institute in India to stand uh, along with the international, uh, you can say, the community. So it's a time we always take uh, opportunity and try to see that uh, how effectively this can be get uh, uh, percolate among the students and how effectively the department can uh, come forward and introduce such type of courses so that students can uh, learn these uh, subjects somehow theoretically and somehow practically because we don't have the facility to provide the training on to the AI or the robotics. But the Professor Thomas from the university which he belongs have the facility of having the training on hand, training to the students. And uh, we are giving a thought whether our students can be trained through this uh, program and have some uh, interaction with the university uh, so that our students can have the theoretical as well as practical uh, hand on experience in this particular area also. So that whenever our student will look forward for to go into the abroad, either for the higher studies or uh, looking forward for the job into the uh, international industries. So this was the idea. Uh, basically, I already told you this umbrella under which we generally uh, uh, conduct the technical uh, and all other activities under the department. And uh, it, will, it is going to happen the last event that will be the national level paper presentation by the students across India. Uh, we have already team in place and the date is already announced that is the 22nd uh, March 2024 is going to be the day of event where the whole day the department will be engaged uh, for the starting with the uh, so many events are there going to be happen simultaneously and uh, it will be aimed by the uh, alumni meet. So it always the pride that we started our alumni when the we know that at the entry level we have the VAA that is Visit Alumni Association, but our TA that is Textile uh, Manufacturers Association was started long back, I think uh, almost 15 years back prior to the starting of the VAA we came later on, and that from that time it is a legacy of the department that we every year we try to see that. We call our alumni onto the campus for the gathering, and uh, we can have the good interaction uh, from the industry people and uh, our alumni and uh, the student, so that the strong bonding can be happen between the student department and the industry. So we have the industry institute interaction can be happen in a better way for the betterment of the uh, department and overall for the betterment for the students. Uh, indirectly, we have already get benefited through such type of activities you must have seen in the last few years. Our placement is being rose like anything. Uh, earlier, we were struggling to place our students, but uh, last year's or prior to that, you must have seen the average packet that is given to our student is higher than uh, some of the core courses. And uh, we are proud of that. But it is also at the same time a request to all the students those who are working into the team and the various activities just see that you are also equally participating in your academics. So don't, uh, as a senior faculty and as a faculty of the department, it is a request to all those people who are sitting over here from the department, just see that you are completing your academic activity and taking it very seriously. Then only it will be possible for the department to come forward for your better placement. So. Uh, wish you all the best to all the team of the Vastara and let us have the grant of our four years. Uh, let's continue to be Thank you, sir.
Before we talk about the achievement of our honorable guest, I would like to invite our head of the department, Dr. Neha Mera Ma'am, to give a bouquet of honor to Professor Thomas Grease. Completing his primary education in Catholic primary school in Fulham and later joining the 182nd uh, Tank Battalion of Germany. Later, Sir finished his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering at RWTH Aachen University, followed by his doctorate in same year 1995. Sir started his professional career in his undergrad years beginning from student research assistant ITA of RWTH, later on joining as member of scientific staff and becoming head of department of fiber and textile after the end of his doctorate. Sir, ha Sir, has, been, Sir has been head of head of, tech, uh, head of technologies of uh, fiber and central division of tech for fiber and textiles and since 20, 2020, 2001 sir has been a professor at rwth arkin university for textile machinery and director of ida sir has also held many important positions such as spokesman of interdisciplinary forum of arkin university member of north Kind Venice Folian Academy of Science, Steering Committee, Des Exploratory Research Space of Aachen University, and many more. Sir was award awarded by Tech Textile Award for Innovation in 2003, Artex Award for Innovation in 2002. Sir has also been given honorary professor po position in Lomonosco State University. Over his long monumentous career, he, he has been published over 750 of which were held at international congresses. Thank you. Now I would like to call Sir, uh, Sir Professor Thomas Grease to the stage to commence his lecture. for the hearty welcome and the nice introduction. Um, yes, uh, Vitae of Altman always sounds like that, but it starts actually like you. So when I was a student um, and I look back, then it was all about that I was always curious to endeavor new things. So I went as a student to Japan. My wife at that day, at those days she was my wife, she went to India. And also in my young professional career, I've been to India many times, setting up the man-made fiber industry here. And it's now 25 times, actually, that I'm um, he, uh, to India. And it's always as, um, know that it's like coming home. And coming home is also a matter of alumni of your esteemed institution. You probably have heard of Dr. Maud Reiner, who take a bachelor here, then a master at IIT Delhi, and then went his for his PhD. Uh, we don't say student, the, the PhD people at our institute are already researchers responsible for the projects. Took an MBA, uh, was head engineer at our institute, and now uh, since 10 years, uh, we have a company jointly together here in India to bring the technology from Germany to India. One example, so I don't want to talk too much about that, uh, but what I want to say, it's, it's up to you. You should take every chance, every endeavor 
um, to step into something and then later, 20 years later, everything makes sense. So, um, <clears throat> another thing I want to say, I'm very happy to be here. Um, actually, I gave um, several talks, not many, but some, uh, in this institution before COVID. And COVID, of, of course, break, uh, break many things down. And I'm very happy to be here again. And with an even larger audience. Um, my talk, as you can see, will be about the three transformations. This uh, sounds rather technocratic. At the end of the day, transformations are not something from here to tomorrow or this next year. It is a generational <coughs> task for the industry. And um, at the end of the day, I only can say what are the three uh, transformations and how you cope with it. You are the one who have to manage those transformations. Um, it will, of course, consist of textile examples, uh, but it will, it will not be a textile uh, lecture because you are here in an institution which has a long history of very good textile technology education, and this is not nothing uh, what I want uh, to cope or to tackle with. I want to give more the outline what are the industry needs, and because, as I mentioned before, to give you a guideline, a hint, where you have to look to what might be your future challenges. Um, then, from question before I start, uh, please raise your hands. Who is, has a background in textiles? Please raise, raise your hands. Who has a background in textiles? So it's a mixed group, this is good. So uh, anyway, because... Um, <clears throat> of course, I'm the director of the Institute for Textile Technology. I'm also, of course, in the academy and university in the field for production in uh, technology. And what you can learn of the talk is these three um, uh, transformations are not only in the textile industry. They, can, they are actually <clears throat> the big challenges of all industry. Of course, there will be textile examples for a certain reason, but if you look at it for a more... Uh, non-sector perspective, I think these three transformations are valid in every industry. <clears throat> so this was just a, a short introduction. Um, when I was asked to tell something to the distinguished students of this institution, um, of course I'm also very busy, so I tried to find what are the real trends, <clears throat> what is ongoing, what shall I talk about? Um, if you go into trends, you find things like that. This in the internet, mainly from consultants. And if you don't take a closer look at this, because afterwards you're more confused than before, um, they give you tons of information, clusters of uh, customers, trends. But at the end of the day, um, you're more confused than before. Then, of course, um, we are today, 2024. What can you do if you have to prepare a presentation? I asked ChatGPT, so uh, give me, um, <laughs> give me a present, make me a presentation about mega trends, of course, bio transformation, digitalization, technical functional products, and these kind of things. And uh, ChatGPT is always right, but not always helpful. So it says, uh, well, I'm um, a text-based AI model, so I'm unable to create a PowerPoint presentation. So I had to do it myself uh, again. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are three transformations, um, and these uh, can be found in every industry sector. So um, this is not only something which may, might be lasting a decade. I would even say it's last will last a, a generation. So your generation. There is industrial transformation, especially in India with large scale textile manufacturers, I always have the discussion, it's not anymore about just producing something, a material or product cheaper with economics of scale and uh, cheap labor costs. This is one model which has its limits. So all industry, and then you find, for example, given a textile example, you find towels, there are five producers worldwide, Four, three of them are in India, and that's it. And there will never be ne next year five, uh, 10 or 20. So um, 
economics of scale has reached really its limits. Um, then there is, of course, you know it, sustainability. And sustainability, especially in textiles and polymeric materials, means getting away from fossil materials, but I will also say fossil energy. And then last but not least, digitalization, automation. At the moment, AI is on board, but maybe in five years something else might be um, uh, important, like quantum computing or whatever. So um, the name of each thing might change from time to time, but the three transformations will last a generation. What I will do is I will now go through all three of them, a little bit shorter to the first one, because this is always very specific from sector to sector, and a little bit longer to the other ones. And after one, we can have, I would say, uh, that it's not too long. We can have a short round of questions if you like to. So please, already when I'm talking, um, consider what you want to ask me. Let's start with the industrial transformation. Um, the big question, of course, um, in textiles is, what is the future of textiles? And I think I'm now so long in this field, it's valid as for every field, um, there is always a reason for fiber-based materials. Um, we had the textile industry, uh, the textile industry was um, quite a, a natural based industry. This was one reason why I choose it. Uh, so we had 60% uh, of our fiber materials in the mid of 80s was nature based. And this was one reason, besides carbon fibers and all, also by chemistry, but um, uh, one reason to step in. Today, the picture is opposite round. Now, only 30%, and this will not be uh, able to increase pretty much because um, the production of uh, natural fibers uh, is in uh, competition with food production. And uh, so, with every step forward, especially in uh, GDP-growing countries like uh, India and uh, China, um, the need for more consumption can only be covered by petrol-based material. So, it is now roughly 130 million tons in our case, with packaging is almost the same, and uh, every year 10 million tons of fossil-based materials comes on top. So it sounds almost like an uphill battle if you want to become uh, fossil neutral um, with our just with our materials. And there are, just one remark, there are a lot of developments uh, for new polymers. I don't believe in this. It's the same as in, in metals. Um, it will, when I'm thinking back 30 years, there were much more different kind of uh, materials. It slims it down now to polyester, cotton, and whatever. Um, the better solution for any, not only for fibers and textiles, is if you have to something like a drop-in solution, which is different in the beginning, but at the end stays the same, because then you can use all the application knowledge and you're much quicker into the market. If you want to introduce a completely new material, uh, then the area of transformation is over. So it takes a generation typically. And anyway, so uh, we have to go for that. And the question is, can we do it? So it seems like an uphill battle. Um, population is growing. Um, the development of the nations is growing. So, well, I say, it has to be, first of all, we have to do this. And the second is, uh, it's not nothing new. So roughly every, every 50 to 70 years, the raw material basis changes completely, also in aircraft, by the way. Um, and what you can see here, uh, on the example uh, of fibers, it changed from endemic fibers, which were produced locally in, in uh, Europe, it was flax and linen, uh, to cotton. Um, with all the political if side effects, of course, um, in, the, in the 19th century. Then at the end of the 19th century, uh, the first man-made fiber came up and they were not petro-based, they were wood-based, bio-based. So, um, the viscose actually was 1897 developed in Aachen University, one reason why we have this focus at our university. And then it shifted over the first uh, synthetic fibers 
um, were actually coal based because if you produce coal for steel production, half of the, the um, coal which you dig, raw, uh, dig out of the earth is um, not um, solid. So this um, leads to polyester, polyamide, and this first generation of uh, polymers. And after World War II, I would say even after the bigger wars we had around, so in the 70s, then of course uh, petrol-based materials took over. All the polymers, plastics, what you know. Um, and then if you go in this logic, maybe now, seven years later, it's the time to change again. And every big change starts with small steps. And the question is, how can you uh, defossilize? I do not like decarbonize because this is bull, you know, no, this is nonsense. Um, because we're all made of carbon um, and um, we need carbon-based materials. So the, the better frame, which is not so easy for some of the politicians and some of the uh, media people, is decarbonization, defossilization. And this means, um, gives you three strategies, actually in Texas maybe four, there's higher use of biomass, there's still a lot of agricultural waste which remains unused. You use carbon dioxide, like nature does, and build up material. And then, of course, uh, recycling. There is a colleague of mine who runs our recycling actually always says when Germany would recycle all the cotton which you are using, on, or sorry, only half of the cotton which they are using, we would be the sixth largest cotton producer worldwide. So. Um, it takes a while, don't be afraid. So, um, um, but if you talk, follow these strategies, um, then the only thing is um, you have also to look where does uh, the energy for your production side comes from. So going to defossilization in the materials only makes sense if you also go for green energy. Otherwise, it's not a green story. And if you, I had a lot of discussions um, last year with Indian producers who say, yeah, I'm now using bio-based or recycling or whatever. And I said, and your energy, where does it come from? Um, um, if you don't do the full picture, sooner or later, one of the big mass medias will come and discover it, and then you're not green anymore. So doing, half, doing it the halfway is not the right way. Yeah, I will, because, um, I learned that it's not only textiles, so I said I will give you one example uh, just for recycling, because uh, one of the highest potential is recycling. But I also um, felt with all the discussions in the last year, uh, the uh, discussion on recycling was, especially in, uh, with politics, politicians are, they think if, um, and sometimes also fueled by engineers, they think everything can be recycled. This is not true. Um, and some of uh, the inventors and in startups say, and we can do now 100% recycling. I say, don't say this. Um, they will nail you down with this promise because it's not right. And um, all of the discussions uh, led me to the point to bring this part of the presentation down. Um, in several, uh, I hold it at the uh, Academy of Science in Germany. I gave it to the International Textile Machinery Federation, which is the World Federation for Textiles in order to set a statement like the second law of thermodynamics which also said that energy cannot be cycled limitless and so yeah so this is a talk which i will uh, also publish uh, in this half of this year not only for textile because what i say here is valid is on the example of textiles but it's valid for every material for every material, for every material. There is always recycling. So the textile people know uh, this town in Italy, Prato. I know that there are five textile recycling hubs in India. Um, and it looks like that first. Then you have to sort it, even if you decolorize it. Then you do a pre-preparation. Then you do spinning and then you make nice fabric out of it and this is one of the owner of such a recycling fabric a company is very happy but 
Um, in former times, there were even in Germany uh, roughly 50 mills which do recycling, today none. So the big question is, it's possible, and recycling also for other materials is also possible. Why is it not working yet, or not working fully? Uh, what is not possible, basic laws, because it, infinitive recycling 100% is not possible. And what is possible? Because we have to work on that. The threats. When you talk about circular economy, always engineers talk about recycling technology. I always say, well, before the recycling comes the change of behavior. Because um, the um, Earth Overshoot Day worldwide is on 2nd of August. In uh, well-developed countries like America and Germany, it's the 2nd of uh, May. So if we, for example, would um, decrease our consumption by factor two and a half, we would be in. And this is the biggest turning knob. And it's of course critical because if a political would say, well, please only consume half of it, then you would not be voted again. So, um, and this, um, this of course is a big challenge, but it's the biggest uh, tuning knob. Then the question is using it often. This is a very interesting study. You can do it also, thank you, at home. It was a so-called wardrobe study published two years ago. I like it. Um, they analyzed different consumer because in, I do not know how it's in India and Germany. My generation also, ah, the young generation, fast fashion, they are the pollutant, and then the younger generation, and you with your big and so on, and uh, SUV. And so um, this is finger pointing. And I like the study because it, I always uh, like mathematics. I'm a lover of numbers because it gives you clarity. And the Wardrobe study make different consumer panels, high class people, middle class people, low class people, young people, old people, whatever. And then they analyzed by a public panel what is in their wardrobe. And how many times do you use the textile in your wardrobe? So probably your wardrobe look like that. Any, anybody has in, having such a wardrobe? Me not. So um, maybe it looks like that, more likely. So the question is, uh, how many times do you use the textile? And unfortunately, I also already give the answer. It's only three to five times. And you say, no, not me. I'm wearing it very often. Make this study your own. You have your personal uh, pieces, like, for example, my blue chino, this one, my blue business shirt. I'm, um, I'm wearing maybe 50 times, maybe 100 times. I even uh, do repair of it. But the most of the things, for example, um, the wedding suit, I only have worn once, isn't it? So, um, or maybe twice, but anyway. Um, so so um, make this study and you can see how much could be changed. For example, with a new business model, why, don't you, why do you have to own your clothes? Maybe your basics, yes. But all those which you only need wise for a summer party, for whatever, when President Modi is coming to your university, you probably have to wear a cut or whatever, then you can rent it. Because next time he comes, probably it does not fit anymore. <laughs> so, um, big, also the second big knob. Then, of course, reuse. <clears throat> I think the generation before you, as my generation also before me, my grandmother, I still remember when my grandma ripped off uh, a pullover and re it again. Do you do this again today? Very, very seldom. So the reuse of something or putting into a second life is again a big issue. And then, this was of, uh, what you can still experience but which has become more and more seldom. Because wool, the price of wool was when I was young was 10, 10, uh, almost 10 euros eagerly. Today it's two euros. So anyway, and then after that comes recycling, not first. And then of course uh, there are challenges, threats. Um, this is a German word, as we can do, like kindergarten or whatever, um, Weltuntergangsstimmung, um, Mülltonngängigkeit, which means in English fit to bin, because the most of the textile products are small like a disposable diaper, away. 
You don't wear it to, one kilometer to the next recycling bin, isn't it? Um, and so on, so on. This also counts for other consumer goods like batteries, which people, if you make an interview, say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm doing recycling always. And then if you look into their bin, mm, different picture. And of course, we have collecting points like this in Germany. Um, but typically, you bring the higher value or the higher volume textiles there. But this model collapsed because many countries in the world said, no, we don't want to have this old waste from you, rich countries. We want to do have own uh, recycling loops and so on and so on. And in, uh, in Europe, for example, this, the business model of collecting, which was before very much from Red Cross and so on, charity driven, does not work anymore. So we have at the moment roughly 10 consulting projects to help them to find new business models because the old, and this means there is no direct pipeline into recycling at the moment in Europe. So these are threats. Now it comes to the point where I disclose to you the second fundamental law of recycling. And I really said, named it like this because it's not only of textile recycling, it's valid for metal recycling, for wood recycling, for paper recycling, for any recycling. And it went, of course, in history, and it must be said, uh, the first formulation of the second law of thermodynamic was also like this, not in numbers, more in, let's say, um, basic understanding. Later, this funny kind of mathematic come up, which causes students of a little bit headache in thermodynamics. I loved it. I hope you too. Uh, but uh, the basic law of thermodynamics is very simple. You always lose with every cycle energy. It was formulated by different people. Lord Kelvin, Max Planck in Germany. Um, and before they put up this, this is a simple version of it, um, uh, formula, they stimulated that there is no limitless recycling of energy. And actually, if we talk about recycling processes for textiles, for paper, for metal, whatever, it's also a circular process. And this means you always have to put in energy. If you use recycling steel, for example, has, has a high recycling quota in Germany, but if you don't use hi uh, green hydrogen, then it's not a green technology because you need energy to melt it up and to solidify it again. So the second fundamental law of thermodynamics also counts for recycling. Maybe you say, yes, it's clear, but have you read it before? Me neither. So everybody thinks, oh, when I do recycling, everything is green. <laughs> no. And so only the sector coupling between the recycling and the re renewable energy, and this is a picture which is from uh, the Renewable Carbon Initiative. If you're interested in this topic, I really can, it's downloadable. They have a lot of good studies. Renewable Carbon Initiative. It's, they started, Michael Caro started, of course, with the decarbonization of materials, but then today he sets only the sector coupling between ener renewable energy and uh, renewable material renewable carbon is the only way to go. Now it goes more specific. The material second law of recycling, you can say for, for textiles, I give you two examples for textiles, but it's also valid for every material, for metals as well. You lose properties. That's it, full stop. If you have a big car and put it into a furnace, how much percentage is carbon? The paint? plastic materials, how much carbon is in steel? 0.8%. And then you will e easily see that there is more carbon going into the furnace, not of the steel, and then it's not steel anymore, it's casted iron. So this is one example just to say you always lose quality and you have to cope with that. And there is no limited whatever. Um, for example, with fiber it's quite clear, they're getting shorter, the shorter you are, the uh, less properties they have. Very simple. The poorer the properties. You can do something against it. You have just to cope with this. And for example, 
um, you can use cascade application from high quality application like lingerie to shirts to jeans to isolation to paper and then burn it. In order to go against this cascade, you have to blend it with longer fibers. This thing is the same you have to do again with paper, with metals and polymers also. Or you can separate um, the, the poorer parts and then of leave it on the level, for example, of a business shirt, but then you lose the short fibers. And you know it, Mr. Arash, it's when you comb, comb cotton, it's maybe 30%, 40% is getting off. And um, these are the three uh, examples, either cascade use, short fiber separation, or blending to cope with uh, the quality loss. But at the end of the day, if you do the normal um, recycling process and mechanical recycling process, the efficiency is roughly 70%. 70%, 49%, you know what I mean. Eh? So with every cycle, it gets lost, less. And people still believe 100% recycling. I went to a Texas conference, there was a guy presenting a new recycling technology, he said 100%. I said, don't do it. The politicians will only remember 100%, and next time you can come and say, ah, my mass balance is only 70%, they will kill you. They will kill your business. The same, uh, just to mention, <coughs> counts also for polymer. If you remelt it, they lo you lose po uh, chain lengths. If you lose chain lengths, you lo lose tenacity, and so on, so on. Same thing. And um, especially with polymers, then one point behind this is, of course, temperature. If you're using a low temperature processes like solving, then you probably get 90% regain. If you, you know, the hotter you get, the lesser you are, the, the worse you are. So um, very simple. There are again measures against it. You can do solid state polycondensation. You can do partial depolymerization, new polymerization, or you can do a depolymerization and um, a new polymerization, and even maybe for some remedies, we have also developed technologies going to the syngas or recycling oil and then making, let's say, a kind of uh, chemistry because petrochemistry is then wrong. Organic chemistry based on recycling oil is the only option to do. There's also another threat, another challenge, maybe I should have put it before. Um, there is a function limitation because you, on the other hand you have material efficiency and this means mix of material. Just to give you one example, I could give you numerous examples. You have a polyamide fabric, there's dye stuff, there's a polyester lining, there's a polyester velvet with carbon particles to make it nicer, uh, to underline your face. Um, zippers made of pom or metal, um, metallic or plastic buttons, logos and whatever a velcro, some glue. At the end of the day, this is a nightmare for production, for recycling, because if you look at your label, then it says, oh, this is 100% polyester, or it says um, the chino is maybe 70% cotton, 25% um, polyester, and 5% elastin. But this is just an indication. So, um, of course, you can go through in the design process to use as few materials as you can do, design for recycling, or you design it that you can take away, take off easily, for example, hard parts and so on. Um, and of course, the question is always, if you design with a multi-material mix a product which lasts five times longer than a mono-material product, what is better? Big question, isn't it? Um, so they have to do a comprehensive uh, life cycle assessment. Okay, um, there, is a, there is a third law, fundamental law, so uh, I couldn't do it down to one. So the first one was the thermodynamic one, the second one was the material part. The third one, I am also have also an MBA, so I have to do this, um, is economically, and no, again, nobody is talking about. Um, everything becomes more expensive. This is not a nice news, um, but it is as such. And there are two reasons for it. Very simple, um, um, because if, uh, when I was a young engineer, we, I put, uh, developed the carpet recycling plant for Europe, 
and we were so enthusiastic that we can collect all the waste of Europe. We did it and we end up with a polymerization line of 20 tons per day. This is economics of scale, ridiculous. We have built here in India and in Taiwan polymeric lines of 200 tons, so 10 times higher. We have made calculations. If you, for example, collect all, all uh, um, chinos and genes from Mumbai area, what you can get, um, and then you probably add with 20 tons, 30 tons. Uh, production line today for, for genes and chinos um, in China or in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or in India has um, at least 20 times higher capacity. So you will never, ever can compete with economics of scale. And also the energy consumption is then higher. And this means, you, my estimation, to take a drown and challenge me maybe half a year later, uh, when you have own exact figures, you are five to six times more expensive if you do recycling. And I've developed in my professional life three technologies and they all failed. All failed because of the economics, not technical wise. Because the challenge is, at the end of the day, the, cus the consumer is a bitch. He said, I'm green, I'm green. But uh, for uh, Hugo Boss jeans, more than 100, uh, Shino, more than 100 euros? Mm. No. For a um, um, typical high level business shirt, 50 euros? Not more. And um, there is a con the uh, McKinsey study, which is good. Um, they say 10%. I'm not quite sure with whether, because you have these typical market segments and you have to match them or not. And the question is uh, how to overcome this. And typically you have, uh, in the most countries, you have three, at the end of the day, three, um, in, uh, three price segments, independent from um, the product category. You have a low cost, for example, a standard shirt, I don't know, maybe at Reliance or whatever, then a certain brand for the middle class, and then you have, of course, a luxury brand, um, Van Laak or whatever, where the shirt costs maybe more than 150 euros. But on the other side, if you go to the market volume, between each of those levels, there's roughly a factor 10 between the market volume uh, of products and so you have to face this. This is true, I'm a, a race biker, the race biking, you have one for 1,000 euros, 3,000 euros, 10,000 euros, nothing in between. And this for cars and whatever. So the question is how to cope with that? New business model. And there is room, there is room. I may just make a cost breakdown uh, for a chino, a business shirt and an outdoor jacket, European prices. Um, but the, for, first of all, um, the la one of the largest parts um, is the value added tax. So in Germany it's 90%. Well, it's the price plus 90%. So it's on, on the to total chart is 16%. Um, so this is always with calculation with percentages. Be aware of it. So. Um, but they're 60%, which the state always get. <coughs> Theodore Roosevelt, you know him, the American president, he once said there are only two things which will always be true forever. You know them? We all die and pay taxes. So um, there is no chance that the state will say, oh no, I don't need the money, um, because you want to spend money. And somebody had, had to get it, and he gets them from you. And, um, so anyway, the second one is the production part is rather small. If you take a t-shirt or shirt, it's around 5%. And if you now say this becomes maybe from, from the material side, or even if you produce close to Mumbai in the markets, becomes five, four or five times higher, there's still enough room where you can catch the money. And then of course, a big portion is uh, the brand. The brand is very important, so if you develop a recycling solutions, don't neglect to also create a brand, otherwise nobody recognizes it that you do something good. But the largest part in all of those three pie charts is the retail. And the retail means logistics, means to fill all the consumed temples, 
Um, and this is highly inefficient because there, there are um, some consumers, but they're 10 times higher than the materials. So for, and also it, it fuels the so-called pre-consumer waste because what you find um, in an outlet, what you find on the internet platform, only half of it, it which is produced is afterwards sold. So this is actually not only economical wise, it's also ecological wise, a very big tuning knob. But you have to do this, otherwise you can have the brightest technology idea if nobody buys it. Okay, the perspectives. I mentioned already sector coupling is important. Then of course the question is, um, I read two, two years ago a study, the Circular Economy Initiative Germany, um, which ends, which goes for batteries and uh, cars of course, uh, big boys toys, and um, it ends with half a page of wisdom and one of the major, major take home message I took home was um, <coughs> Recycling is not just one technology, it's, it consists at least of 10 to 12 different technologies of different sectors which have to be combined in an individual way. This needs new ways of collaboration. Very simple. And this said, whoa, this is true, I said. What can I do? And we had, of, uh, the good thing is, I later showed it also, we had the Open Innovation Platform um, for digitalization, and we said, why not having such a thing, a creative lab um, on recycling? And um, someone who knows me, when I want to have something, I want to have it first worldwide. And so um, I went down to my people and said, we have to do something, because of course we are working on textile processes for recycling, like tearing and spinning and so, but this is only the one part. You have from the collection to the sorting to the uh, dis, uh, disassembly through to whatever the recycling processes. It can be chemical, it can be thermal, it can be thermal uh, chemical, it can be textile based, it can be non textile based, it can be paper based. And if you make a count, you need at least 20, 20 different technologies which are not taught in a textile uh, department and in a, our textile institute. So we have to collaborate with other people. And what we did is what we basically the idea of. The creative lab, you can see it here. Um, it's running now one and a half years <clears throat> together. Of course, I have a good idea, but I don't have money. So I was looking for somebody who has some money. This was the state of Bavaria, which gave the money. So this, they just set, just to set up the platform. And then we invited tech partners, um, tech partners for sorting, for high speed, um, for high-speed identification of materials, for laboratory equipment, and so on and so on and so on. And uh, the good thing is, since, as you remember, the recycling quota is so low in textile, and since we are, have been the first, we got, uh, we bought on uh, 25 tech partners in less than half a year. They have to pay money uh, to be part of the store because they cannot do it alone. Neither Lakshmi nor name it what, uh, Uster, whatever. Um, second is they have to bring in men people, so they have to attend, for example, the regular meetings, um, they have to also maintain the machinery, and they have to pay, of course, um, an annual fee, which let us run basically the operation of the re recycling atelier. And this is now running since one and a half year, very successful, and um, this is the only way to go. People come there with a big pack or less of waste and say, what can I do? Can I do better design for recycling? Is there a possibility for reuse? Is there a possibility maybe to take it back and give it a second life and so on? Or can we do recycling? And then of course, then all the questions come up again, which I mentioned before. Very nice, a very nice toy and a very nice infrastructure. This I already mentioned. This is actually basically um, dedicated to mechanical recycling, which is the most energy efficient, but not the most efficient in means of material efficiency. So we are thinking now to set up a similar thing in Aachen area for chemical recycling as well. And here there are some questions. I think I've talked already enough about this topic. Um, beside the, te the technical 
um, development of solutions, creative lab. Of course, we also do uh, organize um, the scale up because um, the scale of a creative lab is small, but we have industry partners to scale it up in two or three steps. And then, of course, we also want to influence politics and so on and so on. Another topic which is, of course, important, I mentioned before, we, we, you have to have, we have to have a, a different labeling, different <coughs> identification. This is a hot topic, not only for textiles. But we have one project where we do it with uh, floor covering, a uh, European project, because I'm pretty much convinced those digital passports are a must-have, but they will be very, very specific. There's, it looks totally different for a car, obviously, than for, for a smartphone, than for a textile, than for an airbag and whatever. So this is just, there is still, in, so we, this is just the basic setting. And we are just starting, so there is enough room for you to contribute with clever ideas. So let's work together to make um, the world more circular. Short break. So, any questions so far? Or did, did I paralyze you now? <laughs> I need a short break. So I'm open for questions and, uh, every time. To raise your voice. Yeah. Sir, so myself, Richard, uh, I have a question that uh, is there any difference between sustainable product and an eco friendly product, or it, it is the same? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, sustainable is, of course, a word which is more, let's like, say, a philosophical one. Um, and <clears throat> it's really interesting that especially rural societies always have been very sustainable because they have to give the land to the next generation. And this actually doesn't mean um, if you are behaving uh, sustainably, and then you have to be uh, environmental or economic um, uh, friendly. So it is, yeah, it is basically the same. But then, of course. Like with many words, people are using words in a different manner. So this is, um, <clears throat> so basically yes, but not exactly. And um, uh, but it's a very good question. If you have these kind of words around, and especially when we talk about interdisciplinary, and this counts for this topic even more, uh, you ha have to first of all before you talk, and maybe if you before you struggle and fight or whatever, please be clear about your words. What is the word, first of all, and what stands behind? And this, there are always, even if you use the same language, uh, interdisciplinarity is um, a field of high misunderstanding because people using words and think the other side also has the same understanding about the word. And therefore your question is absolutely right before you ask, if, I, if somebody comes up and says, my product is sustainable, First, asking how do you measure <laughs> and not talk. Thank you. Good. Okay. Yeah. Transformations are headache, and um, so last one. A digital transformation. Um, Everybody at the moment is talking about AI. This is for me, uh, actually I don't like it, to be honest. I like AI, like I like math mathematics, but there are actually many people, if they talk about AI, ask them, what do you mean by AI? Because they are not really knowing what they mean. AI, it's also nice if you go on Wikipedia, I've done this the last two years, it changes sometimes from five to six different methods. And it's different if you go to the English Wikipedia or to the, or go to the German or to the French. Um, the definition of AI is always slightly different, even from day to day. So um, a friend of mine who is very strong in um, aerodynamic simulation, he always said AI is should better named as best guess. And this is right. It's a mathematical method which has its importance because of big data, no doubt. And we are very, our institute is, I would say, leading even in AI and textiles. But 
it's only one method. There are other, other sorts of mathematics which, uh, which are also nice and shall be used. And I'm more a fan, fan of, doing, of using the right math for the right problem. It's much better than to use AI for maybe count two plus two. Anyway, um, so the, the future is uh, not only AI, one thing, it's AI plus, so my, I'm very much in favor of using hybrid um, automation, physical models plus data-driven models, because AI is a data-driven model. And of course, never ever forget that you have to measure something. Where do, do the data come from? Are they accurate? Do I have to filter them? Uh, how in which frequency and so on and so on. So data filling the data lake is also even uh, as important as using AI. And last but not least, there has to be connection to the real world. So what is um, the AI in industrial field? If I go, therefore, digitalization is a must. It's in the textile industry was actually always the driver. For example, the punch card, the digital control of a machine was invented 100, uh, 220 years ago close by Aachen in north of France by Mr. Jacquard. And ever since, um, we used, for example, neural networks when there was a name, we used AI when there was no name for it uh, 30 years, 40 years ago, and so on and so on. Um, but if you categorize the use of digitalization in industry, I uh, found this categorization quite helpful. So there are, of course, using AI to automize entire processes, what we call industry for zero in Germany, other countries call it smart factory and whatever. There are digital pro production processes like additive manufacturing, digital printing, uh, and so on. And then there is, of course, a high trend towards digital product. Every, everything becomes digital. Even a pet bottle or a drug jar has maybe a transponder in it in order to uh, see how is um, the stock. And, um, and then, of course, when it is in, uh, in industrial application, also the work will change. So these are the four categories where you can um, divide into the trend of digitalization. I will start with a topic, of course, uh, how will this influence our future life um, and our future work? In Germany, say Arbeit für Null, work for zero. When I was um, making a similar presentation last year, there was, um, at the same time, there was a, um, a study published which compared a medical doctor with ChatGPT. And th this was the result. Uh, if you know doctors, you know, especially German doctors, um, empathic uh, response, um, yeah, this can be better always. So, um, and it's, it's almost 10 times better, 10 times better, 10 times better. And this, uh, this is of course one thing, and maybe if you are suffering, you don't, yes, you would appreciate it, uh, but also would appreciate, of course, professionalism, and then the quality of the response even was with the uh, chat GPT based uh, first uh, examination uh, was also four times higher. And really, um, I had, for example, uh, I went through, through, to an orthopedic five years ago, and he looked at the x-ray picture and said, oh, nothing, well, you're in, bad shape, in bad, good shape, and said, well, uh, because I'm a material scientist, there are some cracks, is it, is it good? Ah, yes, you say. And I said, oh, what an expert. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, it leads to that um, the ChatGPT was, it was a blind test, of course. Uh, the ChatGPT was preferred, for sure. And then you can say, oh, yes, if this is as such for medical doctors, how will this be for engineers in the future or for other people? Um, well, is it an opportunity or a threat? Well, the one thing is, um, this I can say by experience, when every time when a new technology came up, the robots in the 80s in the car manufacturing, people said, oh, there will be no work in future and um, whatever. 
then our unions forced us down to 30 hours per week. Now we are again at 40 hours and we have full, full employment in Germany. Um, and it will become even worse. So I know some companies in Germany which has um, stopped their, pro uh, their production because they don't find skilled people. And last time when I was here in India at the uh, ITMA, it was the same. Finding skilled people is the main um, um, slowdown for uh, the development of a com company. And the reason is quite simple. Uh, especially in Germany, not so much in India. We have um, me as a baby boomer. When I go in retirement in six years, there is only one person following, just by democratic logics. And then, of course, the number of people going for engineering and the traditional fees, not for digitalization and biotech, um, has dropped in the most countries by roughly, in, on average, worldwide, by 30%. So we don't have enough people to do the work. And therefore, I'm pretty much sure that not a full automation, but an assistant uh, through AI and robotics uh, is a must. And not only for the production, as it has been in the past, also for the white color, for the engineering, procurement, whatever, uh, and even sales, um, part of the story. The question is how. We have Industry for Zero. It was very much driven um, towards the shop floor, very typical German approach, but also in Korea and other countries, it was very much uh, optimizing the production. Um, it has to change um, to the white color um, area, as I mentioned. It has to change from just the production, following the industry trend, which I mentioned before, to covering the entire value chain. And it has to be. Um, Beside being lean management driven, which it has been in the past, it has been to go to value driven because you have seen it from the recycling business. It's a value driven model. It's not a cost driven model anymore, business model anymore. Therefore, we named it industry for you. We, I will have at the next Nova Fair also an expert panel where we discuss what, where is digitalization driving to. Well, the question again is much, and it's also many things of the concepts are. Wake. So the question, how can you do it? Because you have to do it, not me. Um, and how? You could do it the classical approach. You can start with a pilot phase. You implement it. Um, and then you roll it out. You start maybe with a PhD project. Then you have a funded project and so on. Um, don't do this. Uh, this will t All this success story, especially in digitalization, didn't work like that. The only solution is being agile and using open uh, innovation. I give you some examples. It starts with education. So, for example, we have a robotic course, which is an interdisciplinary course, not only from the AI people, but and only from the robot people, but also consisting of um, um, social sciences and so on. One thing. This is. I will now go through it very quick because I already take so much time from you. I will just put glimpse light now on the different activities in order to spark your creativity. So I will just go through the faculty. Of course, this might be boring going through faculty because this is more an organizational logic of a university, but it sh should show just the variety that um, AI and robotic can not only be found in one discipline, it is found in everything. For example, um, there is uh, we have a very strong group of informati informatics. Um, Professor Jaco, for example, from our university invented Industry for Zero. And then, of course, there is an alliance over different universities, over different institutions. In architecture, we have um, one colleague which is dealing how can we produce individual houses on site by using robots. Then there is uh, in the a field of civil engineering because a lot of work, if you look around, the painting, the plastering, whatever, um, not the basic construction maybe, but especially everything, the installment of the light, the heating, there's so much manual work and you don't find skilled people. And if you don't find skilled people, you have a nightmare later. And um, then, of course, in our faculty, mechanical engineering, we have our institute, we deal of course with the handling of textiles for composites, um, with the sewing process, and other people are, this is on the upper left side, 
Then, of course, the colleagues from welding and joining. It's on the upper right side. Then assembly of cars and uh, machine tooling. Uh, Aachen is um, the largest university for production technology. And, and so on and so on. I could, in our faculty, I could give you, of course, examples for hours. But also in other fields, like mining, the same. Um, um, there is a colleague of mine, she is um, autonomous driving in uh, mines and also um, all the logistics, she's working on that. Um, then we have in the field of electronics uh, some robot experts using, fo fo focusing for example on agrica autonomous agriculturing, autonomous uh, space uh, topics. The Faculty of Economics, what can they do? Very interesting. So Frank Piller is very much looking into new business models, not only in cycling, also in digital manner. What is the value proposition? How is the consumer involved? And um, he giving lectures uh, by himself, but through his avatar, for example, he always, when a new technology comes out, he analyzes what could be the influence on existing or what could be new business models and we have um, Aachen is the leading university with text, deep text uh, spin-offs um, and Professor Malte Brettel is running our incubator. Faculty of Humanities. Even Humanities today look, uses very much AI for example to analyze textes uh, and so on and so on in the daily work but we have strengthened um, the humanities, especially because the engineer felt it's not all about technology. As I mentioned, for example, with recycling, changing the human behavior or accepting new technology is even more important than the technology itself. So this is, um, we installed the so-called Humtech Center, um, which is a human technology uh, interaction center. People there, the professors come from social science, basically in their PhD and in their professor career, but before they had also one, uh, Mrs. Grammelsberger, she studied IT, um, Mr. Böschen has a background in um, industrial engineering and so on and so on. They, they are quite colorful co <coughs> colleagues helping us to take the right direction in our technology development and analyzing the human behavior, because at the end of the day, if you ask a consumer about a new technology, especially in Germany, they say, oh, something new done. You know? um, but maybe he's liking certain aspects. or he's, um, So people do not say what they like, and what they buy, or what they take, and so on. And this kind needs very certain skills uh, for evaluation of new technologies. Then, of course, also in the medical faculty, there are three areas, uh, where you can, four areas, actually, three areas of medical services and four of service, uh, the fourth one on non-medical services, which can be automized because they also do, do not have enough people to, to give the medical service to the people on doctor level, but also um, on nurses level. So one is, of course, the... I do not know where it, this does not work. But, um, the robot guide therapy is really in the surgery room, making, for example, hip joints or whatever. But then, especially in an aging society like in Germany, uh, the care of old people is a big market, a big society need. Then, of course, we have also the rehabilitation after, um, after um, accidents. And so these are the three different categories of medical service. And then, of course, you have a lot of um, service in a hospital or, for example, a sterilization of, of uh, all the uh, knives and scissors and whatever, delivering um, the pharmaceuticals, changing the mattresses, and so on and so on. So uh, here we have we will soon install the model hospital where we showcase this technology. And of course, last but not least, um, the how to collaborate. We have uh, the excellence cluster now since 10 years, the largest uh, excellence cluster dedicated to production. More than 200 researchers, 35 institutes are working together on different aspects. What is the next generation of uh, in, um, digitalization and of course, 
um, it's also going into the area of sustainability. And we have different centers. For example, all the new robotics, if especially a robot working together um, with an operator um, or a patient, uh, or if two or three robots work together, a, a traditional robotic control does not work anymore. Because today robots are just slaves, putting one thing to another. In the next generation, they have to interact, so the algorithms have to be faster, they have to consider the environment, and therefore AI becomes the driving factor definitely um, for the control of robots. Therefore, we founded the AI Center, and it became a success, not only the, uh, of my colleagues from informatics, which dedicated to AI, but through the entire university, we have uh, 95 faculty members um, from 85 institutes using or working on AI and they come together of course to learn from each other, to learn new methods, to learn experiences but also to cope, to develop domain specific solutions and last but not least have it also ethically, legal, social and um, economically feasible in both directions. These are just the landscape, I don't want to uh, bother you with that, but it's quite powerful. Then of course, uh, the similar thing which we have for the recycling, we have for uh, digitalization, there are two model factories in Aachen, one is by uh, Boston Consulting and my colleagues from Production Technology, the other one is from McKinsey and us, ours is dedicated to a hybrid product, smart textile, and here we use and showcase the latest state of industrial uh, industrial digitalization. <coughs> Same, it has a business model. So for example, we have now somebody with a specific uh, augmented reality capability. We have the first storage, which is uh, like a Tetris, and so on, so on. Then, so we try to have the latest uh, technology of industrial digitalization in-house and showcase it. So this is how it looks like. It's also an invitation to come to Aachen if you're interested in this topic to work on that. This is just some key performance indicators. It's now uh, six years in operation, so every year we have roughly uh, 1,500 to 2,000 um, visitors. And also, of course, also in other fields like in co uh, commercial sector, we have open innovation platforms. In this case, it's very much to certify um, different devices in order to prove them that they are really um, smart commercial feasible. Collaboration, we have, of course, uh, we do startup fairs because it's always a mixture between new economy and old economy. Um, we have an open innovation platform where people can place their questions and get answers. <coughs> We also look for having new installments where people of different institutes working together. This is, for example, our lab where uh, we work on. Um, <coughs> oops, no, it was opposite one. But that uh, is not the right one. Sorry, that was too quick. Um, collaboration, as I mentioned, the recycling atelier. We have large-scale projects, for example, for bioeconomy, um, a 50 million euro project, where we want to change the textile industry to a more sustainable one. And here we act not only as a researcher, but we're also a kind of um, funding agency, so we decide which projects which we take in or not. And then, of course, we are in several network projects. Here, there is one network project on urban mass uh, customization. And the one result will be there will be a shirt factory down in Cologne, <coughs> mass customizing and producing a shirt. And then, of course, it's much more sustainable because it's an individual product. There is no pre-consumer waste, and so on and so on. So this sh shall give you, and last but not least, we're also setting up close to Aachen um, in industrial side, but at the end of the day, if we talk about industrial uh, digitalization, it is not enough to showcase in, in the vicinity of our university. Uh, it has to be become real life, and here uh, the T7, T7 industrial side sh shall showcase all the new things in 
by digital transformation and sustainable manufacturing of textiles close to the Rhine rural area, uh, which is with 20 million people, one of the um, metropolitan regions in Europe. And this is, so this shall just show that right from the beginning, the first ideas, we are also doing this through collaboration, then we really want to have um, an in societal impact. So this I skip. So my, the, my bottom line of this very long talk was there are three transformation ongoing, the industrial uh, transformation, the sustainable transformation, and the digital transformation, and nobody can do it alone. Um, you, we only can solve this through um, cooperation of existing company, young, fresh people like you, different disciplines, different countries, different sectors, um, and then I'm very positive that we can challenge uh, and uh, can really manage the three big transformations. Thank you very much. Still any questions? Rice, your voice. Uh, I am audible. Yeah. Hello, sir. I am uh, Abhay Sundarke. As you said, plastic or any other recycling of any product in particular uh, has the cost element involved, the energy consumption that we do not talk about. So, how do businesses who have sustainable products as their key parameter, how do they sustain on a longer basis? Because as a consumer, we tend to buy products which are cheaper and do not look upon the uh, the sustainable side. You, let's say a person who has who is on the lower side of his yeah. So how how do businesses that have sustainable products how do they sustain? Do we have to uh, bring out awareness alone? Awareness cannot build our business on a longer time. Time. So how do we approach that? This is an excellent question, which of course would take too much time to discuss to the final end. Um, to create awareness and to change behavior will take too long. So maybe somebody of you have stopped smoking or I'm at the moment trying to get, again to get in good shape by sports. Half a year is nothing. So, um, and therefore this, and for bigger changes of, uh, of your behavior, it will take maybe your life. So, um, and this is too long. Um, one topic which you can do within your limit is to create business models which do this. For example, if you uh, develop a recycling technology, for example, we have a concept, not done it yet, where you collect chinos, where you do the recycling, you have to include, bring three companies together. One is the um, collector, one is the, the material producer, and one is the brand producer. You have to create a brand. And then properly you can uh, match um, the price target one. And then the other thing is, of course, the people have to know it. Um, <clears throat> but to, there are also chances because everybody of us has a smartphone. Today, if you go to a shop, you have get almost no information about the product. Yeah? Yes. So if you have, for example, a product tag or uh, with a passport, which is not only a passport, which communicates with you and answers your question, then um, I think there is not all the consumers, but I would say there is 20 to 30 percent at least, which will um, go into this adventure and uh, use this, um, and so on, so on. And last but not least, of course, legislation. Yeah. We have a recycling quota for other things. Why not for that? And so this, there's a mixture of answers. But also, um, for example, if you take. Pet bottles. In Germany, we have almost 100% return rate of pet bottles because we have um, a system, what do you call it, fund system, you pay 20 cents, um, and not incentive, there's a word for it, doesn't matter. So when you buy a bottle, you have to pay 20%, which you get back and so on. Refunding, refunding system. And why not having this close? 
getting a refund of five euros. This will make you walk to the shop again. And this, uh, because for a pet bottle it's only 10 cent or 20 cent, which make the people behave different. And so there are a mixture of laws, a good business model, incentives, um, and, and so on. So, um, but um, again, it's not enough to make a nice recycling technology. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Other good questions like that? Please pass Mike. 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 <laughs> What is the near future uh, in Industry 4.0 in the perspective of bio transformation in the field of manufacturing, manufacturing materials, uh, in the cutting edge technology we have introduced digital transformation in the field of printing, cutting uh, and uh, uh, making new models and making something. But using bio, uh, what kind of uh, innovation you are looking for along with AI? What is the emerging? <coughs> Actually, uh, again, it does not have to be AI, for example, if you use blockchain, which is not AI, um, and would, for example, interlink and give the consumer the information he wants. Um, this could be a very short step. For example, I was in a surprisory board which produces these shinos, and I know um, they, 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 they use a the bio ink, the co cotton was made in Africa, um, what else? So the working condition, because sustainability is not only of materials and energies, they are more uh, uh, sustainability goals, and everything was fine, but nobody knows. And they fell out of business because their chino was 14 euros, and in, in Morocco you can make it for 11 euros. And, um, um, and the thing is, um, you have to bring this information to the customer. If I would know that Svetlana or something in Romania is making this browser and she's happy because her son is going to a school, I would buy the jeans, but I don't know it. So having a blockchain about the information involved is one step. Then of course, um, using digital printing in the right method, if you make a, an individual product for somebody, then the people are mo more likely to use it. For example, a very simple, very basic thing is, this shirt has my initials. It's a very simple business trick, to, to be honest, but that step falls in, step in. Um, so my, I buy my shirt because I know my size um, and um, my favorite brand. It fits me, and they have. So I buy it through the internet. Um, then I, typically you get uh, a bow tie for free, which you don't need anymore today. Um, and but then you get you get a discount of five euros, and if you put a cross on your initials, then you have to pay six euros. It's a very simple thing. You do it because of one euro. Um, and um, but this makes it much more sustainable because you cannot return it. Fifty percent of the um, mail, mail ordering in the internet is returned; it's waste. And so, by such a simple trick, you make an individual product. You can do it with printing. There is, for example, um, Bivolino in Belgium. You can upload your own a pattern, you can choose a pattern, whatever, which you've seen in the subway, and then it's your shirt. And if it's your shirt, you're, it, first of all, you pre, again, you uh, avoid the pre-consumer waste, and second, the people are more likely to use it more than three times or four times, because it's their shirt. And so these kind of things are going much beyond just the technology. And then, to be honest, when you really go into industry for zero, especially in textiles, you only find very few companies which are really have the level of industry for zero. So still, there is a lot of basic work to be done. For example, not taking Excel sheets from sales to production uh, uh, enterprise uh, resource planning, and these kind of things. Very simple things, which have nothing to do with AI, which are simply Analyzing what is the process, which data are needed where, and then interconnect. It still has to be done. Large potential. Thank you. <coughs> oh, final
Yes. Sir, my name is Mith Gala. So, my question is like, how an industry would get impact from digital transformation? Sorry. How industry would get impact from digital market transformation? Oh, big question. Um, I would say, um, if you take um, the percentage of textile industry now, um, as with any um, mature industry, the percentage of which you get from your income will go down, will go down and down and down if you do not reinvent it. And then um, this is why I said, why I said, only if you create new value. What, for example, think about your iPhone. I have a smart, uh, I have an iPhone, and the iPhone costs thousand euros for what? Sometimes I, well, my company pays, but um, so uh, anyway. But this is an, before a, 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 a telephone from German Post costs fifty euros or hundred. So. Of course, it has a line and you can only walk three meters. But the question is, what is the customer really wanting? And then, of course, what can you maybe also earn through uh, the data you uh, process? Uh, there is one example, and I don't want to take too much time. Very simple thing. Um, very simple product. You have Everybody has it. It's uh, the label in your textile. It's, it's not really a woven fabric, it's a small woven fabric. So anyway, and um, very cost competitive. And the, the company who is producing 90% of the machinery, uh, Müller Frick, um, they're producing machines for labeling. And then uh, I always say, if you want to go in new areas of digitization, hire young people. First one, maybe you have a daughter or a son. Um, next generation, oh, this is one. Second is separate from your own business, old business because otherwise it will cannibalize. Müller, Müller Frick did it. Um, the, Jakob Müller. Jakob Müller in Switzerland. And um, the son, at the age of 30 or something or whatever, uh, good university and this kind of stuff, um, uh, had the duty, set up a new company, a smart label. And uh, it, the good thing is Müller had all the technology. So he, they have the jacquard weaving, so they can weave an antenna. They have, the, they have a kind of digital print.